Welcome everyone uh, to Markets of Tomorrow. And over the next half hour, we're going to explore uh, the interventions that the public and private sectors can take to foster um, the new markets. And again, when we look at uh, new markets coming out of the pandemic, we're looking at how we can create more high quality growth. And when we talk about high quality growth, we're really talking about not just uh, economic value add, but also value add from an environmental and from a societal equity perspective. Uh, today, I'm joined by four thought leaders uh, relevant uh, to this topic and how we create uh, the environment to spur uh, innovation that creates uh, more inclusive and more sustainable growth. Uh, before we um, uh, get into the panel, I just want to uh, highlight a few um, a few points. Uh, this session is being recorded, so you can uh, pick it up uh, later on the, the forum website. Um, again, this session will be um, uh, closed captioned and will go for about uh, 30 minutes. Once we've completed uh, the public session, uh, we will have uh, uh, 15 more minutes uh, for a private meeting uh, for additional uh, Q&A with our top link um, community. Uh, once the live stream has uh, concluded, uh, we will pose questions to our panelists uh, via the, the chat function. Uh, so with that, uh, just to introduce our, our topic and, and panel, um, you know, throughout the pandemic here, I've, I, I've thought multi, many times how uh, similar the situation is with respect uh, to the wildfires that have uh, really devastated my uh, home states of uh, California and Colorado in the United States. But from uh, wildfires, we can draw inspiration and, and nature has shown over many, many centuries the ability to renew itself so long as the environment is, is there for uh, plants and a diverse set of plants to um, uh, seed themselves and, and grow. And so much like recovering from a wildfire as we recover from the pandemic, we need to consider uh, the environment that's going to foster um, this new economy. And so uh, to uh, dive into this topic, I'm honored to um, uh, introduce our panelists uh, today uh, who will help us uh, uh, through this topic. And so uh, first I'd like to introduce uh, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, who is a professor at uh, the University College London. And again, she has um, is the, currently the founder and director of the Innovation and Public um, uh, Purpose. Uh, she has authored uh, several books uh, related to entrepreneurship and the interventions that uh, and basically correcting misconceptions about uh, both the, the public and private community role. Um, I'm also so welcome uh, Mariana. Uh, I'd like to introduce um, Andrew McAfee, who you see uh, with the MIT uh, backdrop. He is a principal research uh, scientist and co-director and co-founder of the Institute of, on the Digital Economy at the MIT uh, Sloan School. And again, has authored several books, uh, again, relative, uh, related or directed to uh, the uh, basically the coming digital economy. And, and we'd like to tackle that with you um, in a few minutes, uh, Andy. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Akeem Steiner. Uh, again, Akeem has had a very distinguished career at the United Nations and is currently the administrator and lead of the United Nations Development Program. And uh, he has a, a long history of providing uh, economic and uh, uh, technical and, and policy ad advice to the United Nations and has uh, sponsored a number of initiatives in different countries related to spur growth. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Glenn Weil. And uh, again, uh, uh, Glenn is, uh, I, I think, going to uh, share uh, with us uh, some accelerants for uh, change in creating this new economy. Uh, Glenn currently is the founder and chair of the Radical X uh, Change uh, Foundation after a very distinguished academic career. So again, 
welcome to all of our panelists. And, and uh, with that, let's uh, jump into our topic. And so, uh, Mariana, um, I'd like to uh, turn this over to you, if you can uh, love to hear your thoughts on, um, on actually those experiences and case studies you've uh, explored and written about uh, related to creating uh, basically the environment uh, for fostering change. Sure, so thank you. I'm gonna put on my timer because you said three minutes and uh, <laughs> the only way to do that is to time yourself. Otherwise three minutes turns into 20 very quickly. Um, so right, I've just written here some notes for myself as you were talking because I think, you know, we need to sort of take this at different levels. So the first thing, you know, WEF, the World Economic Forum organizes every year, the Davos event, the great Davos event, where last year at least, all the talk was about stakeholder value. I think even the year before and probably even the year before. And I feel like this is the moment, this is the COVID mm -hmm. moment to really test <laughs> that talk in terms of how do we walk the kind of stakeholder value approach, but to go beyond the notion that it's just a corporate governance issue and to actually bring that concept of purpose and purpose-led kind of capitalism and stakeholder value at the center of how public and private and third sector institutions co-create value. Um, this is why I actually wrote a whole book on value to kind of debunk some of yes. the myths about value. So the myth is really mm -hmm. that value is created in business and what the public sector, for example, does is just fix problems as they come about. So fixing market failures. And even though market failures do happen, there's a lot of them for positive externalities, negative externalities, asymmetric information, and so on. We wouldn't have gotten the big technological changes of the past had the public sector simply just bandage things up along the way. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think that in order to address the problem at hand here, we need to really think of it as a process of co-creation and co-shaping of markets. So it's not so much about what are the markets of tomorrow, it's mm -hmm. how do we govern that process that actually then also achieves the kind of outcomes that we require in order to have an innovation-led, inclusive and sustainable form of capitalism. And here, I think also history is useful. Um, you know, the big technologies actually, you know, what, what economists call general purpose technologies came about from problem solving, right? The internet mm -hmm. solved a problem. No one was worried about the internet. They were worried about getting the satellites to communicate. GPS, mm -hmm. same thing. Uh, and you know, where would Google and, and Uber be today without the internet and, um, and GPS? But the question, the kind of modern question is what are the big problems, also the societal problems, <laughs> the wicked problems around climate, around health, around inequality that might have that same level of dynamism and catalytic effect spillovers, mm -hmm. right? Software was a spillover along the way to get to the moon and back again mm -hmm. um, that can really be driving not just innovation, but also rethinking really inclusive growth, right? So innovation and inclusive growth can really be and, and sustainable growth should be kind of interacting hand in hand instead of you know, pretending that somehow we have the welfare state on one side and the innovation state on the mm -hmm. other. And for this, I think a useful concept is the concept of pre-distribution. So how do we actually embed within the public-private partnerships uh, ecosystem uh, ways to really build a more uh, symbiotic and mutualistic ecosystem between the public and private sectors? And you know, this is really about making sure we're governing intellectual property rights, around even the vaccine or around the COVID, ther COVID therapies, but all health mm -hmm. innovation in such a way that really fosters innovation and not rent seeking. Um, how do we make sure that the prices of drugs, uh, for example, really em embed within that price, that collective value creation. So the 40 billion a year that the NIH and the US spends on drug innovation also then gets reflected in the prices, but also conditionalities. And I'll end on that because I'm 20 seconds over conditionality so that it's not about subsidies, mm -hmm. guarantees, and kind of different types of yeah. handouts that the government gives, but actually, you know, that it provides a huge benefit to society, but that it's also conditional. So the COVID recovery schemes in some countries mm -hmm. have been conditional on the businesses receiving the funds to, for example, reduce their carbon emissions or not to evade tax, et cetera. But that needs to be done ex ante, not ex post, just through redistributive uh, policy. So the more right. we can really think through that pre-distributive uh, public-private partnerships to achieve the kind of growth we want, the better. So how do we design those into um, our solutions? So un understood. Thank exactly. you, Mariana. Yeah. Um, Andy, 
I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, the role of uh, and the potential for digital innovation and it was specifically um, in your writings, uh, how you see the role of uh, these public, uh, both the public sector and the private sector in realizing the potential of the future digital economy in a way that can make it uh, more accessible, but also uh, achieve uh, the inclusion ends that we've described. Yep, thanks, Jim, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today. One of the things that a lot of us are worried about with the markets of tomorrow is what we see with the markets of today, especially in high-tech industries. These markets are dominated, in most cases, by a pretty small number of very big, very powerful, very profitable companies, and a lot of people are worried about that and we are revisiting antitrust arguments or revisiting all kinds of arguments about the need to constrain shrink break up these dominant tech companies and we can rattle off which ones are dominant today yeah. what i find really interesting though is that my career is just long enough to remember when we were having very similar kinds of arguments about very different companies. I remember when we were in, uh, deeply worried about the stranglehold that IBM had over the high-tech industries, when we were deeply worried about the stranglehold that Microsoft had over just about everything digital, when we were worried that Netscape or AOL was going to become too dominant with the internet, when we were worried about the stranglehold that Research in Motion and Nokia had on the mobile phone industry. Um, I, I hope all of these are striking us as quaint because we're really not worried about those things anymore, even though in some cases, as with Microsoft, we still have large, powerful, very, very successful mm -hmm. companies. None of us worry about the stranglehold of innovation that these companies have anymore. And to me, that's instructive. And it drives home the point that the pattern that we see over and over again in high tech is one of dominance and then disruption. In other words, these companies don't fade from prominence and they don't voluntarily give up their stranglehold. I don't think government intervention via antitrust or anything else mm -hmm. is very effective in getting them to give up a stranglehold. Mm -hmm. I think something happens out there in the fast changing world of technology that they miss. And when they miss it, they become mm -hmm. research in motion, Nokia, IBM, Netscape, and we just stop worrying about them. I, I wanna be clear, I do not know what is going to disrupt the incumbent giant technology companies of today, but that actually doesn't bother me very much because I didn't know what was going to interrupt the last generation of them either. <laughs> when we think about bringing out the very powerful tool of antitrust and taking action against these companies, which America just announced today I was doing against Alphabet, I think we've had for about half a century in America a standard that works pretty well. People are revisiting it now, and I don't think that's a good idea. The standard is a good old fashioned consumer welfare standard. Are consumers better off as a result of these companies? To me, the answer to that is a pretty unambiguous yes. And the really simple question that I ask myself over and over is, think about these, these giant dominant technology companies of today. Are they still behaving? as if their markets are contested. And to me, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. They continue to drop prices. They continue to innovate, to spend heavily on R&D. These are not the actions of lazy, complacent monopolists. Mm -hmm. So I categorically agree that all great concentrations of power demand vigilance. They demand oversight. In some cases, we might need to take action about social graph portability, for example, or about strengthening mm -hmm. privacy protections. Absolutely. But before we get out this really, really blunt, very powerful cudgel called antitrust and breaking companies up, I think we do well to take some lessons from history. And I think that would calm us down. Yeah. Andy, that's uh, that's really well said, and I'm uh, thank you so much for uh, highlighting kind of lessons that uh, some of us have have lived through and very instructive, uh, and to some extent uh, uh, going against some of the uh, you know per prevailing uh, community thought around how we should regulate or how we should intervene to avoid the concentration of of tech power, if you'll have it. Um, so uh, taking a 
slightly different uh, tack, uh, Akeem, uh, having, uh, we all respect the United Nations has been a, a, a very important uh, catalytic body for the global community to tackle uh, areas of common uh, interest, including uh, health, uh, agriculture, uh, economic development. And I would love to hear your experiences with respect to uh, what we've learned from past United Nations initiatives and how we may the, apply them to foster um, markets of tomorrow. Thank you, Jamin. It's a, it's a great pleasure to join um, my fellow panelists and you on, on this discussion. And I think my, my starting point is a little bit um, picking up from where Mariana and also Andrew spoke just now. If you take a historical perspective, I think the first thing that um, whether it is in a global context and globalization, global markets certainly have been at the forefront of our minds over the last couple of decades, or you take a, a local, um, you know, agricultural produce market, a national economy, markets are not something that uh, stand separately from society. And I think that's very important. We often have a temptation, the discipline of economics, certain let's say ideological views in that school <laughs> of thought have also propagated the notion that you know, markets left under themselves will be um, efficient, um, Pareto optimums mm -hmm. are achieved. And I think history has taught us time and again that this is a fallacy, and not just from the perspective of those who, in a sense, want to regulate markets. In fact, some of the most significant legislation has been market enabling. And Andrew, it's interesting you mentioned antitrust legislation. That's certainly one area. Competition is, in a sense, a paradigm that markets value and that societies generally value, but also fundamental legislation that enables a market to function. The notion of intellectual property, for instance, was a legislative act in order to enable the kind of investment economy to emerge that drives markets. So I think um, the first thing is markets are not just supply and demand, they're not just technology led, they are in many ways uh, embedded in a larger set of choices. And I think here, we, um, we have to, particularly in the period of COVID-19, realize also how much we rely on the state in moments of crisis to stabilize markets. I mean, we don't have to you know, look at the examples in great detail, whether it's the Federal Reserve Bank or whether it is the kind of um, cash transfer schemes that are being put in place right now. Markets, the private sector, entrepreneurs, large or small, rely on the state to provide a degree of risk management and stabilization mm -hmm. functions. But looking forward and into the markets for tomorrow, I think um, some of them will be led simply because something is invented that people hadn't even asked for, but that is mm -hmm. you know, of great utility and therefore provides enormous opportunity. The question is, um, do the markets of tomorrow simply emerge from entrepreneurial ingenuity and opportunity, or are they shaped also by the kind of social choices? Does inequality matter? Um, I led recently a, a panel for the Secretary General of the United Nations on fintech mm -hmm. and the sustainable development goals, looking at digitalization and the whole implications for the financial markets and the financial system. And it is fascinating when you look at this because, you know, digitalization has created extraordinary opportunities, including for financial inclusion, but it could also mm -hmm. leave behind billions of people and create greater inequality. It is in that confluence, I think, of both possibility and if you want uh, perhaps the, the managing of risks and choices and preferences that we have as a society, that it, we best will understand the markets of tomorrow, not least because more and more people are engaged in a political debate and dialogue about what is a market that we support and what is a market we do not want. Let's remember, we have also taken decisions based on science, sometimes that mm -hmm. ozone depleting substances or asbestos should be banned. Slavery was once a market, I mean, tragic as, as it may sound. And there are ethical choices, science-driven choices, and also the kind of society we want to be. And I think many companies today and in the World Economic Forum, we have spent, I think, often sessions trying to understand how will that future business be shaped by things that are not only to do with the realm of what is decided within a corporate or company context, but also by the consumers, by the supply chains and ultimately, and this is you know, part of what the United Nations does, a stable global economy, which um, has more to attract countries to work together than to be divided. And this is clearly a critical consideration in the midst of a pandemic, as much as it is for the future of 10 billion people living together on this planet and being able to 
be economically active, but also to believe in a market that is called the global market. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Akeem. Very much here in, in your comments, uh, the, the need to really design in, again, uh, picking up on uh, or building on Mariana's uh, comments, uh, those goals that we want to achieve. And the United Nations is a, a powerful organization that we can still all believe in and subscribe to remind ourselves of what we share in common. Um, and so um, uh, looking ahead, uh, Glenn, I'd love for you to uh, comment on uh, the, the, the potential for accelerance here of, of changing. Again, uh, the pandemic has done uh, great economic damage and, uh, and you know, pressing issues such as climate change uh, won't wait for us. So how do we uh, uh, how how do we look at things that can have more than linear incremental effects in uh, shaping the markets of tomorrow? That's a great uh, question, Jim. And I really want to pick up on the themes thus far and bring them together in maybe a little bit of a radical way to suggest that mm -hmm. you know, as Mariana pointed out, foundational to our growth is um, the public investments in fundamental research and in fundamental infrastructure that make entrepreneurship possible. And as Andy pointed out, fundamental to that growth being widespread and inclusive, not just for equality, but so that mm -hmm. we multiply those productivity gains, not just by the number of people living in Silicon Valley or Shanghai or um, you know, Washington state, but by the entirety of the world, um, if we want both of those things to happen, if we want growth to actually touch everyone so that we get more of it, and if we want mm -hmm. growth to be possible in the first place based on research, we need public investment. However, the public is having an incredibly hard time keeping up with the pace of innovation. We all know this, We all, and, and this really gets to Andy's point, antitrust, these sorts of structures don't really get at the problems before they're already moving on to the next ones. So mm -hmm. what we need is new approaches to have public investment, public control that's not just tied to nation states or to existing structures, but that actually makes these entrepreneurial endeavors democratically accountable to their stakeholders, you know, on, on Mariana's point. And mm -hmm. we have new approaches to do this. Uh, uh, people like Colin Meyer, uh, people like uh, Michelle Meager are thinking about democratizing corporations using the tools like antitrust rather than just breaking things up. And even more radically, we've seen within the blockchain community, within a lot of innovative areas in GovTech in Taiwan and other places, mechanisms that actually allow for market-based but also democratic funding of new institutions to create sort of optimal public goods using new types of market mechanisms. We need to be experimenting on larger and larger scales with these models, which have been incredibly successful in addressing things like COVID in countries like Estonia and Taiwan. And we need to move past the usual division between the public and you know, democracies and markets to actually fuse them together using uh, these innovative mechanisms to accelerate the process of public investment going into private entrepreneurship, going into the regulation and governance that we need to actually spread that growth so that they become part of one seamless process. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Um, I thought uh, you bring up a, a really good point that maybe we can uh, uh, continue. And I'd love to hear uh, the panel's thoughts with respect to uh, sort of uh, uh, investment in basic research that has really been historically a, a great enabler uh, for innovation, but it typically has been handled at the nation state level. What do you think of the potential for um, cross-country, uh, more regional, or even global research initiatives here. Uh, Mariana? Sure, I mean, we already have those, of course, in areas like fusion. Um, the reason mm -hmm. I speak with an American accent, I'm actually Italian, but we moved to America when I was five because <laughs> the US government obviously spends a lot on fusion. We moved to uh, New Jersey, Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, but it was all DOE funded, right? A lot of these, you know, our universities mm -hmm. in, in terms of the basic research is often funded, either DOE, NIH, et cetera. And Fusion, of course, is an example where it is already an international collaboration. Um, you know, also um, CERN, of course, which is where the World yes. Wide Web came from. That's an international collaboration. So I think that's less of a, um, 
I think that's less the question because we know that that's required, at least for like, you know, the big areas where no one mm -hmm. country can do it on its own. I think this issue of how do we then govern that <laughs> so yeah. it actually benefits the global community. So the vaccine is the perfect example, right? That's also currently having lots of both basic and applied research throwing at it, um, but we're not actually as good at governing that process so everyone actually benefits than we are at the research itself, yeah. right? So a vaccine is not going to be effective unless it's universal and it's accessible and it can actually be produced en masse, so the capacity on the ground. And in some ways, we haven't thought enough about that problem. But the other thing is, just quickly, I think there's a bit of a myth that that's the only bit that the public sector has to do, and then everything else is somehow yes. going to happen through, say, venture capital. The reason I wrote my book, The Entrepreneurial State, was actually to plot out and map out all the different types of public interventions that were required to get us you know, all the things in our iPhones today, but also Silicon Valley itself. That was basic research funded by the public sector, a lot of applied research funded by both public and private. Often in some countries, like in Germany, you need institutions to foster the conversation between yes. public and uh, private, so the Fraunhofer kind of institutions, but also patient long-term finance. You know, we would not have high-tech, uh, sorry, startup nation in Israel without Yasma, public venture capital fund, uh, Incutel, which is a public venture capital fund in the US run by the CIA, very important, but even more so procurement policy, mm -hmm. which historically mm -hmm. through mechanisms like the Small Business Innovation Research mm -hmm. Program have actually provided that patient, I repeat, patient, uh, long-term finance to the companies that actually want to innovate. Um, and so the kind of long lead times, you know, 10 to 15 years can be what you have in the Death Valley phase versus mm -hmm. that kind of exit driven venture capital time frame, which sometimes is just three or five years, which rushes the science in order to exit and that's what got us in the biotech sector, all these uh, plepos. It sounds yes. like a pimple or, or a disease, but it means <laughs> productless IPOs, right? If you're rushing just to issue your IPO, then science-based mm -hmm. industries suffer. And Gary Pisano's written a great book on that. Um, and even more downstream, you could look at um, kind of bold policies, right? So without suburbanization, mass production, mm -hmm. which is a big general purpose technology or you know, method of producing, would not have been fully deployed and diffused throughout the economy. And so I think the private sector benefits the most when it is, as I was mentioning yeah. before, co-creating, co-shaping, but has, a, has a, a public sector that is actually quite present across the whole innovation chain, but across each bit is doing its proper job of really doing what the private sector is not doing. And through that, then crowding in the private sector. Um, but yeah. the crowding in dynamic often okay. doesn't happen if, if the mechanisms through which the state is acting is simply sort of a handout, which increases profits, but not investments. Thank you, Mariana. Um, at this point in time, uh, we're going to have to wrap up uh, our conversation here uh, that's being live streamed. A couple of themes have emerged uh, for me. And, and I think going back to a, a point that uh, I, I think Andy made and, and some things we can touch on, and that is that um, when we look at uh, uh, public role, and I think Mariana also highlighted this, uh, uh, public uh, institutions have a very important role in providing very targeted interventions to achieve the goals we want to. If we don't uh, design for something that is inclusive, we won't uh, obtain it. I think uh, uh, other points that have, have I, I think, uh, come out here is that uh, as we look at the public role, um, uh, concepts such as basic research can be, have been historically important in enablers. And uh, we need to um, reacquaint ourselves with the history of innovation there. So I wanna thank all of our uh, panelists. Um, I encourage uh, all of our audience here to read the uh, Insight uh, report, uh, Markets of Tomorrow that the World Economic Forum has just published where we talk about uh, 20 new markets that we think can be both inclusive and achieve more sustainable growth and some of the interventions that the public and private sector uh, can take to accelerate uh, uh, adoption and development of these new markets. Um, so with that, uh, Atilio, I will turn this over to you.